from the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ as Matthew recorded it. Matthew chapter 5, we continue our series from the Sermon on the Mount, which is contained in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. We are going through it section by section. Today we are at 5.43 and reading down to the end of the chapter. Hear the word of the Lord from the New King James Version. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Now, O oh Lord, may the words of this preacher's mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. We pray that this word would come alive for us, that we would get it and live it out, you being our help. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we are bold to pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. I've been thinking about how this Sermon on the Mount fits into a church's life. You've probably been thinking the same thing. Okay, so what's this point, Farmer? You're on this multi-part sermon series, and we're going to be in it a long time. We're up to part 16, by the way. This is the 16th sermon from this series. And I'm sure you're wondering, so what's the point? How does this fit into all of life? Well, I'm glad you asked. One of my questions is, is this a set of principles for new and young believers? Or is this theological sustenance for the more mature, seasoned people of God? And the answer is yes. This teaching is for any follower of Jesus who is serious about living out what Jesus taught. This is a distillation of some of his best teaching. This is practical teaching about how we're supposed to go at faith every single day. In this sixth of the antitheses, which began with, you've heard it said, but I say to you, there's six of those pairs, and this is the last of the six. In this one, Jesus continues advocating for radical, revolutionary ways of being and thinking. He's trying to help us think differently because we are now His. That is, what difference does having Jesus in your life and in your heart make? Does it change the way we do anything, or do we continue at life as we've always lived it, except we now have Jesus? Someone has said there are two signs that could possibly hang in a store when it is open. Business as usual, or under new management. Those are the only two things that could hang in the store. Business as usual, under new management. And what happens when we say yes to Jesus is that we hang out the sign under new management. This is the way I used to live, but I am now a person of Jesus, and everything is going to change now. 
That's what Jesus is pushing here. As if the preceding material were not radical enough, now Jesus tells these hearers to love their enemies. I should just read that and then send you all. <laughs> and have us all just figure out what that means. Now, most of these who were gathered on the mount that day would have had no problem complying with verse 43. That is, complying with what they heard. You heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Oh, we can do that. Because to them, a neighbor was simply another Jew. Oh, I can love my fellow Jews. That's not a problem. And I can surely hate my enemy. That, that is not a problem at all. But this that they had heard is a corruption of what God said. Now read verse 43 again. You've heard that it was said. Here's what they heard said. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But God never told them to love their neighbor or to hate their enemy. Let's look at Leviticus 19.18. This is where this passage comes from. But they have, were not really upholding what God said. They were upholding what they heard. 1918 of Leviticus. Now you'll note as you compare this to Matthew 4 or Matthew 5, 43, that what they heard was a corruption because there is an addition and a deletion against the original. Here's what was originally said. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. God never simply said, love your neighbor. Here's the critical part. I want you to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. I want you to love your neighbor as you would love yourself. They figured out that, no, what we have to do is just simply love our neighbor. That's a lot easier. And let's add something. Let's delete something, and let's add something. Let's add, hate your enemy. Because if we're to love our neighbor, the opposite must be true. We're supposed to hate the person who's not our neighbor. Yeah, that'd be good. So Jesus says, here's what you've heard. Now I say to you, and now Jesus is going to get in their business and get at them about the way they live their lives and the way they respond to other people. I'm probably not alone in my confessing to you how difficult it is to love some people. I, I know I'm not alone. I, I find some people, although I have this command to love everybody, to love my neighbor, and the New Testament understanding of neighbor is not just simply everybody who's like you, fellow Jews. To love your neighbor is to love anyone who's in your sphere of knowledge. Any, anyone you know. That's your neighbor. Jesus says, you're supposed to love these folks. And I'm thinking, I, I want to love the people like me. I want to love the people in my close circle. But I don't want to have to reach out. And, and we hit a wall here. Because he says, but I say to you, now he's going to turn life upside down for us. Listen to what he says. Love your enemies, and in fact, bless those who curse you. We would like to curse those who curse us. No, I, I want you to bless them. Now Jesus is getting into the area of ethics, the way I live my life in response to other people the decisions I make, he's going to start daring to challenge my heart. Because I want to label some people unlovable. And Jesus commands me to love them. Ah. I, I wanted to simply love my neighbor. And I want to hate my enemies. Jesus forces us to articulate our comfort zone. We like to love those 
who are closest to us, and we also like to love those who love us back. We are great fans of reciprocity. You love me, I'll love you. We find it effortless to love those who love us in return. The only problem with that is even sinners do that. I mean, you, you think I'm making this up to me. Let me show you this right here. It's here. Look. You are supposed to love your enemies and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And then verse 46 has this rhetorical question. If you love those who love you, what reward have you? And that's no big deal, he says. If you love those who love you back, big deal. That's just reciprocity. Even tax collectors do that. He says, even revenues do that. Even IRS people do that. <laughs> In those days, a tax collector was the, the, one of the most corrupt people you could ever imagine. <laughs> He says, listen, if you're only going to love those who love you back, even, even, I don't know, tax collector, do that. Even people who are not following me do that, Jesus says. That's no big deal. You don't get any brownie points for loving people who love you. Here's the more difficult assignment. I want you to love those who curse you. I want you to love those who do not love you back. I want you to give yourselves to those who will probably not ever give you any positive feedback and will not love you back. We show off our God when we love the unloved. We demonstrate how God can turn a person around when we love those whom we label unlovable. Did you see it in the text? You honor God when you love those whom he has created. Oh, it's hard. It's hard. But God commands us. This text has us daring to live like Jesus. We're called to love other people without the baggage of self-interest. We never ask the question, what do I get out of it? We love because Jesus commanded us to. And in fact, there is even a, a reminder here of the principle of showing off our God as we interact with other people. Did you see it? It's in verse 45. When you bless those who, who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, you demonstrate that you are a son or daughter of your Father in heaven. Did you see it's in the first clause of verse 45? That is, as you love as Jesus loves, you point people to your God. It's the same principle found in verse 16 of chapter 5. Do you remember that? Just go back a page. Maybe it's even on the same page in your Bible. But in 5.16, you read this. Let your light so shine before men and women that they may see your good works and glorify your God. That is, every time you do a good work in the name of our God, you point the people who watch you to the God who motivates you. Same thing here. When you love people who, whom you deem unlovable, when you love your enemies, you show that you are a son or daughter of God. I point people to my Father by the way I treat them. I love people who, in my opinion, don't deserve to be loved. And I pray for my enemies, and in doing so, I point them to my God. Dr. Benjamin Mays, the late president of Morehouse College, in his eulogy of Dr. Martin Luther King, who was one of his protégés, said, quote, speaking of Dr. King, this man was loved by some and hated by others. If any man knew the meaning of suffering, King knew. House bombed, 
living day by day for 13 years on the constant threats of death, maliciously <laughs> accused of being a communist, falsely accused of being insincere and seeking limelight for his own glory, stabbed by a member of his own race, slugged in a hotel lobby, jailed 30 times, occasionally deeply hurt because his friends betrayed him. And then May says, and yet this man had no bitterness in his heart, no rancor in his soul, no revenge in his mind. And he went up and down the length and breadth of this world preaching nonviolence and the redemptive power of love. He believed with all his heart, mind, and soul that the way to peace and brotherhood is through nonviolence, love, and suffering. End of quote. That is precisely what Jesus is calling us to. Yeah. To live this life of nonviolence, non-revenge, when we see our enemies as objects of prayer, we see our enemies as people for whom we ought to pray and before whom we ought to live this exciting life of Christ following. Hmm. And neither Dr. King nor Mahatma Gandhi can take the credit for nonviolence. It is as old as Jesus. Amen who commanded us to love our enemies. Huh. Not figure out ways to get back at them, but love them. So verses 43 to 47 speak of one issue, loving our enemies. And then verse 48 uh, seems to me to be a little out of place. It doesn't seem to go with the rest of the material. In a one-liner, the listeners are urged to do the seemingly impossible after they've been admonished to do the radical. Here's the radical. Love your enemies. Go out and pray for those who mean you no good. And here's the impossible. And be perfect. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> now, let me close this by, by just peeking at this 40 Eight first. The, the Greek word for perfect, and Greek words aren't always helpful. They, they mean very much what the English word means sometimes. But sometimes to get behind a text and find out what the Greek says is very helpful. It opens up our understanding. The Greek word here for perfect is the word teleos. T-E-L-I-O-S. And teleos in Greek has a number of meanings. It can mean to be complete or mature or full. It can also mean to live up to one's design or having reached its end. For instance, this would be called a perfect microphone, not because it doesn't have imperfections, it would be called a perfect microphone because it amplifies the voice. And inasmuch as it lives up to that for which it was designed, it would be called perfect. Now, are there dents in it? Is there short in the wiring? Is there a problem with it? Is the battery dead? Maybe all those things are true. It's still a perfect mic, not because it's flawless, but because when it is turned on, it amplifies the voice, and that's what it was designed to do. It's telling us. Now, here's what Jesus says. After he talks about adultery, and he talks about lust, and he talks about keeping your word, and making sure your yea is nay, and he talks about loving your enemies, he says, now be perfect. Now, live up to your design. Now, do that for which you were created. Do you know you were created to have a relationship with God? And every time you take that seriously, and every time you get very, very intentional, a 
about your ethics, about your morals, about the way you spend your time, the way you spend your dollars, the way you use your body. Every time you make that decision and it goes in the right direction, you are living up to your desire. Jesus is saying when we walk with him, when we imitate his perfection, we're getting closer and closer to what the Father expects of us. This is not a call to be flawless. We, we can't do that. We are called to be blameless before God, and we achieve that as we walk with Jesus Christ, and he becomes our model. <coughs> We live up to our design. I want to do this. It's going to take the rest of my days on this planet. But I, I want to do this. Jesus knows we incur spiritual debt. You have in the next chapter, we'll get to it, the Lord's Prayer, which we said this morning. But forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors, we, we know we incur debt. Jesus keeps pushing us in this area of Forgiveness keeps pushing us in this area of outrageous love. Keeps pushing us to go beyond the, the keeping, the mechanical keeping of the law. And he dares us to be like him. I read last night a perfect story. It's called, it was a perfect man who met a perfect woman. And after a perfect courtship, they had a perfect wedding. And their life together was, of course, Perfect. One snowy, stormy Christmas Eve, this perfect couple was driving along a winding road when they noticed someone at the roadside in distress. And being a perfect couple, they stopped to help, and there stood Santa Claus with a huge bundle of toys and not wanting to disappoint any children on the eve of Christmas. The perfect couple loaded Santa into their car and his toys. And soon they were driving along the road, delivering the toys. Unfortunately, the driving conditions deteriorated, and the perfect couple and Santa Claus had an accident, and only one of them survived. Who was the survivor? Well, the answer is the perfect woman. She's the only one that really existed in the first place. <laughs> Everyone knows there's no Santa Claus, and there's no such thing as a perfect man. <laughs> Now here's the male response. So if there was no perfect man and no Santa Claus, the perfect woman must have been driving. And that explains why there was a car accident. <laughs> you and I are completely impossible of being part of a perfect couple or living a perfect life. If perfect means flawless. But suppose this is a call to live up. Up to your design. Up to your calling. Suppose this is a call to start being seriously God's people. Suppose this is a call to be Christian. Suppose Jesus is saying, you are now under new management. Look at me. I want you to imitate me for the rest of your lives. Be perfect. Wow. See, we're not merely living. We're living abundantly and we're living up. Yeah. Up to our calling, up to our design. And what is seemingly impossible is a doable mandate. It's impossible if we're trying to accomplish it on our own. It's doable if we rely on the Lord who is ever our enablement. Yeah, yeah. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we confess that we have enemies, some of whom we have created. And we confess we have not always been loving. We pray, oh God, that we would begin to love our enemies as much as we love ourselves. And we sure do love ourselves. Forgive us for our narrow definition of neighbor. Teach us to love everybody we meet. May we express your love 
as we go about our lives. Take from us rancor, bitterness, constant complaint, and in their places, O oh Lord our God, give us attitudes that sound and look like you. Pray for the person who is plotting vengeance even now, who can hardly wait to get home or get on the phone or to go someplace and tell somebody off. Would you please stop them in their tracks? Put them under new management, we pray. We may live in such a way that people will see who our Father is. Pray for persons who don't know you, and therefore this way of living is simply impossible. I pray that you would show them Christ. Through us, that we may live in obedience to your commands. We thank you for the way you have designed us, the way you have wired us, the way you have gifted us. We pray now that we would be perfect, that we would live up to our designs. With all our faults, with all our flaws, we come to you and ask you to help us to live up up to our calling, up to our design, up to what you expect of us. We love you, O oh Lord. We lay our sins on you. We lay our burdens on you. We ask you to help us to be what you would have us be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, we pray. Would you remain in a prayerful attitude? You might be here, sir or madam, and you'd have to say, Pastor Farmer, I am not a follower of Jesus. So this radical idea of loving my enemies is downright impossible. I don't, I don't see how that's going to work. It sounds like if I had a relationship with Jesus, that would be doable. I'd like to speak with someone about how that could happen. That describes you. Maybe you're already a member of this church, maybe you're already a believer, but you're having some problems with your enemies. You'd like to speak with someone about how to get this address settled. And some people who would be willing to speak with you for a few moments after service. And as you do something terribly brave, as we're singing this final hymn, I lay my sins on Jesus. If you would like to speak with someone, you know you need to respond in your heart and in your mind to what God has said this morning. You come as we are singing. I'll receive you in the front here. While you're coming, you're saying, I'd like to have a conversation with someone about where I stand with Jesus Christ. Or I'm already a believer, but I'd like to speak with someone about some very practical matters regarding lifestyle as a Christ follower. Let us begin these holy conversations in which we aim to line up with what Christ has said. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand for this closing hymn and let us pray that we lay our sins on Jesus. Many of you. But even if you don't know a trial, now let's start again, please. <laughs> 
and let us sing as if it mattered. Yes? Yeah. I lay my sins on Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. He bears them all and frees us from the accursed woe. I bring my guilt to Jesus to wash my crimson stain. Amen. 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 